Human-minded kings getting the world in a mess again. It's a who was it question. And ancient symbols with modern applications. It is time for the Quick Study television program and lots to talk about. Stay there as we continue. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Henry. I'm Janice. And I'm Corey. Now here's what's happened. You've tuned into the Quick Study television program where we take viewers through the Bible in one year. Now I promise you this is going to be an interesting ride. We are talking about the ancient king of Moab. Moab, of course, a descendant of Lot. Mm -hmm. And this is very interesting because we're going to deal with even a donkey that talks. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's true. The Bible talks about it. Numbers chapter 22 to 23, we're going to be focusing on that today, where we're going to be talking about blessings and curses and the power and the importance of the, importance of the words that we use. And oftentimes, uh, Janice and Corey, I think even in the media, we often curse mm -hmm. the situation rather than bless the possibilities that God is setting before us. And it's something we need to look at today. We're going to be talking about that. Corey, Bible archaeology is up. What's up? The bronze snake, who later became known as Nehushtan. Yeah, they ended up worshiping that they thing, did. didn't they? But God didn't say to worship it. He did it. not. He said, look at it. We're going to take a look at the cultural context of that whole thing. The worship of the snake on the thing. Sort of. You'll see. Right. You'll see. We'll talk about that. I'm looking forward to that. Bible IQ question, Bible challenge is... Looking for somebody... Who was Zippor? Was he the father of Balaam, the father of Balak, or a prince of Moab? Right. Uh, again, we're talking about this and more. Stay there as we continue. The Bible is living and active. It has stood the test of thousands of years of criticism and challenge. Today it is published in over 5,000 languages and there are over 1 billion Bibles in print today. Over two-thirds of the population of planet Earth in today's world have felt and continues to feel the influence and the power of this timeless book we call the Bible. comes from Numbers chapters 22 and 23, but I want to take us back to the weekend's reading a little bit to Numbers chapter 19 that talks about uh, cleansing and ritual purification that the Hebrew people had to go through. And we're specifically going to focus a little bit, not totally, but a little bit on water. Now water is one of those interesting properties that's in creation, that's in the world, that has a lot of symbolism. Now I really truly believe that everything God created is organized in such a way to teach us who he is and who we are and what that means. Now that being said, take a look at this, the water of cleansing and purification. Numbers chapter 19 outlines the procedure for creating the water of cleansing. Normally, contact with any dead thing would make an Israelite ritually unclean for seven days. But this water of cleansing, required to make the people clean, itself contained the ashes of a burnt red heifer, something dead. This cow, rare in itself, had to be without blemish and never used for work. It was burned unusually out 
outside of the camp with cedarwood, hyssop, and scarlet wool. Even more unusual, the heifer's blood and waste were burned with it, an otherwise unallowed practice. Also, the men involved in sacrificing and mixing the heifer with water became impure in the act, yet the water was then used to cleanse them on the third and seventh days. When examined, this sacrifice of the red heifer is strikingly similar to the execution of Jesus Christ. He, who claimed to bear all the sin of humanity, was crucified outside of Jerusalem. He rose again on the third day and promises that all who accept him as savior are cleansed, their sins paid for by he himself. The power of words is further emphasized in the assigned text today. In Numbers 22, an evil prophet is hired to cast a curse on ancient Israel. And this awakens one of the most shocking events in the entire Bible, a donkey who speaks. Numbers chapter 23 plays out the end of the matter with God's divine protection against an undeserved curse on God's people. Numbers 22, verses 1 through 12. Then the children of Israel moved and camped in the plains of Moab on the side of the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak the son of Zippor saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people because they were many, and Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. So Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this company will lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. Then he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people, to call him, saying, Look, a people has come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth and are settling next to me. Therefore, please come at once. Curse this people for me, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the diviner's fee in their hand, and they came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balak. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight, and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. Then God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? So Balaam said to God, Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt, and they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Numbers chapter 22, verses 1 through 12. Numbers chapter 22 to 23 with the emphasis on chapter 22 we've just read and even with all of their shortcomings all of their rebellion do you know God still blessed Israel why not because of their complete and absolute obedience to God but because of God's covenant with them see it's about God the God of the Bible brings life by covenant not by abandonment we learn from ancient Israel that if we stay on God's covenants and on his path for us, even though we're not perfect and we have many failings, that God will continue to bless those who love and follow him. Now, we are in the wilderness. It is the book of Numbers. Now, they've chosen this environment. God said, you know, I could have taken you into the promised land, but you wouldn't believe me. 
So they've chosen this environment, but God does not abandon them. Now, you know, beloved, if it were you or me, we'd probably just abandon them and say, fine, go live with yourself and fend for yourself. But that's not like our God, no. God is a God of another chance. He's a God of covenant. He speaks covenant. And he never brings life by abandonment. He always brings life by, by faithfulness. That's what the Psalms is all about. Now, there are three truths to live by that we learn from a most amazing passage in the Scripture, moving up to this prophet called Balaam. This is an interesting time. I want to show you again what's going on so you can get a feel over the next two days of what we're going to study. Let me show you. This is Numbers chapter 22, verse 4, beginning with verse 4. So Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this company, the Hebrews, will lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. Now, I want to bring this to you very, very at the beginning of this teaching, and that is this. Human-minded kings will always fear God's people and never understand God's provision. This is true even today. Show me someone who is supposed to be a believer and yet is worried all the time about whether or not God's going to take care of them. Here's a person who is more human-minded than biblically minded. You see, God has promised that he wouldn't leave us or forsake us. He, he promised, that's a promise coming out of the mouth of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the only begotten Son of God. You can find it down in Matthew chapter 28, many other places in the Gospels. And so human kings, they're going to make their future decision based on the limited resources they have that they can see. But God's people, they make their future decisions based on the promises God has given them, not on what they can see. That's what Paul says. He says, live by faith, walk in the spirit, don't walk in the flesh. What he's talking about. Very interesting. Now, I want to show you something else here from chapter 22, verses 5 and 6. I get excited about this. Then the king sent messengers to Balaam, he did. He was the son of Beor at Pethor, which is near the river, uh, in the land of the sons of his people. He called to him saying, now look, a people has come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth and they're sitting next to me. I'm afraid they're going to take the resources. Therefore, please come up at once and curse this people for me, for they are mighty. They came out of Egypt. I heard about that Egypt thing. I heard about those 10 plagues. And perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he who, he who you bless is blessed and he whom you curse is cursed. Now, this is interesting because he's talking to Balaam. This is truth to live by number two. Human-minded kings always misunderstand who God is and who has the power, the power he has. Balak has no idea. He heard about the ten plagues of Egypt, but he has no idea about this God. And Balaam figures he can pull down another god from somewhere. This, this, this Balak does, this guy Balaam, because he's, like he's a powerful warlock, and, and he can do stuff and send stuff flying and all this. And so we'll get him, we'll get a supernatural guy to do that. He has no idea who he's dealing with. And that's the point of the story. Now, here is what God said to Balaam. Verse 12. And God said to Balaam, Balaam, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse those people. Balaam, those are my people, and they're blessed. This is a most amazing statement. Here is truth to live by, number three. God's people must never put their faith in human kings, but only in the king of kings. You see, the truth is that they conjured up the most powerful warlock of the time. They, they conjured up the guy who was the, the most powerful guy who, who did these supernatural things. And they figure they're going to bring him up on the mountain. They're going to look down at Israel and they're going to curse him. And they're going to be plagued with something. Or something's going to, you know, they're going to kill each other. Or, or some disease is going to come on them. And so they're all going to have heart attacks or something. None of that happens. And see, the king, Balak, said what about Balaam? He said, I know that what you curse is cursed and what you bless is blessed. But look what happened. God turned that around. God speaks to Balaam and says, Balaam, what I bless will be blessed, and what I curse will be cursed. You cannot curse what I blessed. 
And so the person who believes in Yeshua HaMashiach, who has God as their Lord, understands it does not matter how cursed the world puts on them. God is stronger because greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world. Unfortunate thing that we have lost in our churches today, not all of them, but some of them, I'm generalizing here, is the ancient cultural context. We've lost it. We no longer teach our children, we no longer teach the congregations the history because a lot of times we don't know it either. And that is so unfortunate because with just a little bit of extra information, everything in the Word makes so much more sense. Now, this, uh, what we're going to talk about today, is an example of that. We're going to talk about what happens in Numbers chapter 21 with what is later known as Nehushtan. It's the bronze serpent that Moses puts up on a pole uh, and when people look at it, acknowledge their sin, they live, they're healed from the snake bites. They, they no longer die. Now a lot of people get confused. Is this idolatry? Well, it's not. Take a look at the cultural context. Ancient peoples often turned to sorcery and the spiritual realm to deal with serious physical issues. For example, poisonous snake bites. All over the ancient world, we find stories, magical spells, incantations, and remedies for snake bites. Most of them revolve around the mystical idea that one can charm and employ snakes and evil spirits. Israel, too, has a run-in with venomous snakes. They complain against God and Moses' leadership. They no longer want to be led. The Bible in Numbers 21 records that in response, God sends venomous snakes into the camp. Because of the cultural awareness of snakes as messengers of evil, Israel realizes the connection. They were wrong to complain against the only thing providing for them and protecting them, God. When they repent, God has Moses make a bronze snake and set it up on a pole. All you had to do to live was look at the snake. No magical incantation required, just look at the snake. The message, acknowledge your sin and live. Over one-third of the Bible is prophecy. The 66 books of the Bible have a perfect record of prophecies fulfilled. But what does the Bible say about the immediate future of the world? And what about the future of Israel? Does the recent rash of birds falling out of the sky, millions of dead fish, and cattle dying have any significance according to the Bible? Join Rod Hembry in his compelling two-set audio CD series called The Coming Storm. This set is a fascinating Bible study on the complexion of the coming one world empire, the rescue of Israel, and the mysterious disappearance of the church, all predicted from the pages of the Holy Scripture. Call or write today for your copy of the Coming Storm Bible Study on Near Future and End of Time with Rod Hembry. When you write or call, please remember that Quick Study is viewer supported, and we need your help to continue teaching through God's Word. Suggested donation is $25, and to receive your copy of The Coming Storm, write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2, or P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 1566801501. You can also use the Internet, or you can call and talk to someone in the office. Call today, write today, and get your copy of The Coming Storm. Places, people, 
Ancient scribes record amazing truth. Ancient scribes record amazing truth. The Bible reports that what we see in the world around us now is not what God intended or created. The original habitat for humanity, man and woman, was a place called Eden. The word means a place of perfect, innocent pleasure. But mankind rejected the instructions of his creator and paid the price, leaving the protection of God the creator. And now the world in which we live is that unprotected place. But overcoming strength is available to those who follow God. Instructions and surrender to the ideas of the Lordship of Jesus Christ is the way we achieve it. It's commonly called the Gospel. Ancient diviners were common in most of human history. There are over 200 cultures around the world that know and understand the danger of spiritual curses and, in fact, spells. Many ancient nations have special positions held by those who cast spells to try to offset curses with other opposing curses. The Bible, too, says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against spiritual forces and entity that entities rather that influence our lives. You know, it's only in the last 200 years that the culture of man has abandoned the reality of spiritual influence in our absolute arrogance. Some would suggest that recent culture rediscovered that ancient evil. It certainly explains the evil among us today, not the least of which is Adolf Hitler. How do you explain the serial killing of the various things that we see. How do you explain the supernatural overpowering of law enforcement officers at some? Some would say, well, it's mind over matter. Well, I mean, the truth is that only in the last 200 years since the so-called Renaissance, which I don't think was a Renaissance at all, but the so-called Renaissance where man was somehow enlightened, I believe man was darkened, and at that point, uh, we seem to have abandoned the idea of external spiritual forces influencing our lives. Janice, when you, when you include the idea of Satan's kingdom and demonic forces, it certainly explains a lot of history and even present history and the present darkness in which we live, doesn't it? It's very true, yes. And the farther that we get um, away from the Word of God, the easier it is to be tricked and to be fooled by that. Now that's an important point. You're talking about access. Mm -hmm. uh, when we begin to dismiss God's miracles, and maybe we begin to dismiss a supernatural God that's involved in creation, uh, we might say, like Bette Midler sings, God is watching from a distance and isn't involved. Well, then that isolates us. And then we then become the master of our own soul and the pilot of our own ship. The problem is we're still on an ocean and there's creatures in the ocean. And so those creatures can't affect us. Now this idea of spiritual reality in your generation, Corey, how do they see it? Uh, well, I, I really can't speak for the, the whole generation. Um, I, I honestly think that uh, for the most part, we're just really curious. I think a lot of us are really curious. I mean, look around and you see what's in our pop culture. It's just a lot of curiosity about all different things spiritual. I mean, you have ghost hunters, you have all these different religious programs, or, or even just the superhero thing. So when you look around, it's just curiosity because it's been so stripped from our culture for so long. And there's something about uh, religion, there's something about spiritual things that speaks to the human soul. I don't, I don't care how old you are. And so because we've made ourselves our own God for so long, I think that the, the turn of the tide is coming where we're, we're again starting to search out, okay, we've removed this about 200 years ago, but we're missing something now, so we're trying to fill it. It's very interesting because you're right. This generation is obsessed with superheroes. Uh, and again, it's a supernatural thing. I think of the, the recent TV series Heroes. Yeah. Uh, but they blame it on evolution, you know, it's somehow it's scientific that we're supernatural. Or there's, an, uh, in, the, in the case of Fringe, there's a parallel universe, you yeah. know, technology. Mm -hmm. And there's this obsession with supernatural, supernatural things. Supernatural things, yes. Fascinating. It's, it's not so clinical after all. Well, <laughs> the Bible is and has been supernatural from the beginning. You should check it out. Don't take my word for it. 
read it for yourself. All right, let's go to the Bible IQ question, also called the Bible Challenge. Corey's going to do it. Here we go. All right, who was Zippor? Was that the father of Balaam, the father of Balak, or a prince of Moab? Okay. I see heads nodding. <laughs> Corey and I, we're working together, man. We are, we are. We're... So what do you think, Corey? That would be uh, Balak, the, the father, father, father of Balak. Balak. Very there good, go. very good. <laughs> Zippor was the father of Balak. Numbers 22, 2. Balak, of course, being the king of Moab, who lived in fear. He said, look at these Israelites. At the they're going to... They're going to lick up the land around us, and, and he thought that God, he th his gods were limited in their provision. So he misunderstood God. We always make a mistake in the humanity and societies of man when we believe that we are limited in our resources. When God over and over and over again shows us, in the middle of the desert even, he shows us, I will supply for my people, gives them manna. What an amazing thing. I want you to read today's meditation. It's in the Bible guide, and we're not, we don't have time to do it. We're going to be going to uh, what we call watch and pray. And the reason we put this on the television program is not to fill airtime, but it's to activate in agreement those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, the Word of God, where a couple of people agree together and pray for those in need. Here's watch and pray. You know, you watch around the world today, and everybody's so angry. Everybody's so worried and fearful about their economic future. Aren't you tired of that? And this may sound strange to you, but the truth is that those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, we, we look to Jesus Christ for our future. He always helps us, and he's never left us. At least he's never left me in the past 35 years. So I want to invite you today, don't be angry. Give yourself to Christ and watch the miracles he will do in your life. Provision for you and your family. But it begins in your heart, provision for sin. See, all of sin and come short of the glory of God, but Jesus died on the cross and rose again so that we could deal with that. And as we accept him as our Lord, then things change in our life. You simply pray and say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose again, and I need you today. I need your help. I'm desperate. I make you Lord of my life. If you pray that prayer and mean it, God will change your life. Thank you for joining us this month on Quick Study as we continue to go through the Bible. Would you pray about supporting this program? At this point, we sure could use your help in the month of February, falling a little bit behind in our giving. But if you pray about it, God will respond by touching the hearts of many people. Thank you in advance, and we'll see you tomorrow on Quick Study.